So um, just want to say hi to all of you, and thank you for inviting me here today this evening. I see that you had made a cartoon of me. <laughs> uh, it looks too young, not enough you know, hair in the face, but this is what I really would like to be. I would like to be on The Simpsons. Um, and there is some website out there which can make your Simpsons character, so I went and made one for myself. Um, but this is who I am. I'm Punya Mishra. I'm Associate Dean for Scholarship and Innovation. Um, almost everything I do, I put on my websites if you want to see any publications of mine or so on. And I've gotten really interested in the last couple of months in this. I was talking with Jim earlier about these AI tools that allow you to create images and write. And so I've been writing, reading, going back and reading a lot of McLuhan and Postman and thinking about the nature of media and learning and so on. So all of that stuff is there. So my background, you know, I have an undergraduate degree in engineering, but I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit, what that means. Uh, but after that, I actually went in, uh, to design school and wanted to make educational film and then ended up getting my PhD in education. So. A lot of my research uh, is in educational technology. I do a lot of work around creativity and design. I'm incredibly interested in the role of aesthetics in learning. I don't think that in schools we give enough emphasis to that. Um, and I've also, you know, have two kids. I've been a school board member. So over the years, I've had a chance to look at the educational system from a variety of different perspectives. But I do think it is somewhat ironic that I have been invited here, and you will know why the School of Engineering has called me. Um, so I grew up, uh, this is where I was born, I'm originally from India. Um, when I was growing up, I was just interested in everything. So I would read science and art and, you know, I went to graduate school in Urbana-Champaign and I realized that I had read a bunch of stuff about cognitive psychology when I was in high school, right? So whether it was poetry or mathematical games, what have you, I was just voracious. And then I end up here because in India, if you're good in science and math, you either become a doctor or an engineer. And I always wanted to be a physicist, so that's why I ended up in this place called Bitspilani, uh, which is one of the premier engineering institutions of India. And this is where the four-year transformation, which goes as follows, happens. And basically what it was is that four years, it just hammered everything out of me. Um, the way the education was structured, there was no emphasis on understanding, there was no emphasis on fun, in learning, in my first year, I remember in a quantum mechanics class, I was sitting and writing limericks about quantum mechanics. I wish I still have them somewhere. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's how you play with ideas, but there was no opportunity for doing that. And sadly, at the end of those four years, I genuinely, I mean, I had decent grades and all that, but I never really felt that I was an engineer. I had never developed that identity, right? And so uh, recently there's a book by my colleague Ron Baghetto called My Favorite Failure. Um, and so he asked me to write a chapter about it and I wrote about those four years of my life. And frankly, failure, that's word favorite and failure don't really work together in my mind. Nobody, I don't want that. If I had an opportunity to go back and revise those four years, I would do that in an instant. Because here was an 18 year old student who loved learning, wanted to do something and the system just beat it out of me, right? And in fact, I was invited many years ago to Purdue University. They have the engineering education uh, school there. And I said that it is, for the longest time, I put the blame on me. I failed. But now I realize that actually you guys failed me. Right? And it has made me a better educator because now I understand when this kid in the corner is not getting what's going on, the fault is mine, not of the kid. Right? It's made me much more empathetic and understanding and so on and so forth. But would I erase those four years? Yes, I would, in an instant, right? And then um, I saw a poster for this place called the Industrial Design Center, where they had a program in visual communication. I had grown up watching Carl Sagan, Jacob Brunowski, um, reading these popular science books, Hofstadter, so on. So I said, hey, I'm no good. I'm never going to be a good scientist, engineer, whatever, because I don't have it in me, clearly. But I can still communicate it. And so I ended up going there for my master's degree, hoping to make educational film. And that's me back there. And the interesting thing here is this. In May of 1988, I had no sense of identity, no sense of feeling of being a learner, of being valued of what I brought to the table. Four months later, September, October of that same year, I saw myself as a designer. Everything that I had done in my life before then, whether it was science or art or 
music and not so much music, but you know, the interest in literature and just the world of ideas, it was fine. And so I realized that there is something that happened in terms of change of identity. I went from being not an engineer to suddenly I was a designer. So I still call myself an educational designer, even though I do a lot of research in the field, I still, that is an identity I carry with me even today. But one thing interesting happened is that that's the first time I got to work on that machine. And there was something that I had done some programming and all that before, but there was something about working with the Mac that I felt that something interesting is happening. And I started writing code in HyperCard, worked with an electrical engineering professor to create software that would help students learn electromagnetism. It was phenomenal. And I said, this is pre-internet, all right? So this is no email, no nothing. But I had the sense that something interesting was going to happen in that space. And so I ended up going to Urbana-Champaign to get my PhD in educational psychology and educational technology. I was doing an internship in Boston uh, with BBN, which is, if those of you know the history of the internet, the at symbol for email and the first internet stuff just happened there. And they had a really good ed tech program, so I was there uh, one summer. And I was browsing a bookstore, and I came across this book called Discovery. Inventing and Solving Problems in the Frontiers of Scientific Knowledge. It's by Robert Root Bernstein. Uh, turned out that finally I ended up at Michigan State and he was a professor there as well. Uh, he's one of the, what do you call them, the, the Genius Award winners. MacArthur. The MacArthur Genius Award winners. Um, and it's a phenomenal book. And I'm just reading this book, it's really interesting. And then I come across this. And it's like a little throwaway section. So there are 400 different representations of the periodic table of elements. So I knew my history of science. I knew Mendeleev and the cards that he moved around and played. And I loved the, you know, the, as, as in terms of human scientific achievement, to take this array of stuff that's in the world around us and arrange them and make predictions and said, oh, if silicon is this way, germanium is going to be that way. And then for it to emerge, I mean, how awesome is that? But this is what I had always seen. And so then I go into this rabbit hole, and UIUC has this phenomenal library, so I just check out every damn book on the periodic table that I can find, and there's stacks of them. And I'm lost in it for, I mean, I went down this rabbit hole. Just look at these things. And I realized that by calling it a table, we were making a fundamental mistake. It is actually a system of relationships between these different elements. And just as you can take the Earth and you can have a Mercator projection and you can have some other projection, none of them are wrong, but none of them are perfectly 100% right either because the map is always less than the territory. And so I got two key insights from this. So one, like what amazing creativity chemists are showing. There's a sci I mean, I remember this, there was a Scientific American article making a case for why we should not use the standard version when I was working on this stuff. So chemists are still creating these things. And as importantly, we deny this to our students. For our students, it is a thing that's on the wall, it is a thing that's in the textbook, and it's truth with a capital T. But no, there are 400 plus ways of representing that same truth. The second in interesting connection in my mind at that time, and I remember thinking this was a very nascent idea, I found this two sentence description in my dissertation, which was funny because it's six, eight years later, that's where it led to the TPAC framework. But there is this interesting connection between technology, representation, and content. So this is sort of the standard version of the periodic table, and you have the actinides and lanthanides lanthanide sitting down there. And actually, there is research to show that it is incredibly confusing to students because they don't know that they have to bump down here, go up, then go back there. So ideally, even in the standard table, we should show it this way. But we don't. Why don't we? Any guesses? Space on a printed page. We, you know, chemists love to pack stuff, information into each of those cells. And either you have to print the book with a special fold out, which is more expensive, right? And so the technology of print has constrained how we think of the periodic table. And then there's the flip side of it. Like now we have a technology which allows us to manipulate, change, pull, you know, shift things around, zoom in, zoom out, click, get more information, bounce out again. And so that led me to develop 
this, which is called flexible learning in the periodic system, which was, oh God, I mean, this was, I don't know how many of you remember this thing called shockwave that Macromedia used to have, creating all of these images, making each of these elements linkable to their database using a file make, I mean, let's not even, you know, it was crazy. This is, this is early, early ages of the web, running my own little web star server. Um, but I created the software that you could go and essentially you could navigate these different tables. So you could say in the standard table, what does, I don't know, um, atomic radii look like? But if you think about it really, it's only when you see the periodic table as a straight line, let's say if you lay out all the elements in line and you look at atomic radii that you see the idea why this stupid thing is called periodic. In some ways the table in the way we represent it because we have captured the periodicity in the design, it's actually now impenetrable to the student, right? And so this software let you do all that. Well, of course, now none of those plugins exist, nothing, so <laughs> it's gone. Uh, but that was my dissertation. But the core idea I want you to take away from this is this, that if we want to think about students understanding that the periodic, it's a system of relationships then there are technologies and ways of doing it which allow you to explore those relationships rather than just a table. So the technology and the pedagogy and the content need to work together. So these are the three pieces that need to work together. So then I end up at Michigan State University. I meet this guy who turns out to, uh, was Jim's uh, office mate back in grad school in Madison, Wisconsin. And Matt grew up in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, which is the home of the Bratwurst, and he's vegetarian. Uh, I love, I used to, have, I turned vegetarian a year ago, that's a different story, but I love burgers. That's the piece that's gonna get me away from being vegetarian is if I get a burger. So, and he looks very cool even without glasses, I should say that. Um, so we started working together on a lot of projects around faculty development to how to integrate technology in teaching. And this is where I stole a lot of ideas from my design background to create these processes and programs which we call learning technology by design or faculty development by design. We have a book on that. Uh, started doing a lot of work with like K-12. So one of my most uh, favorite projects was one of the last things I did before I came to ASU was this project with STEM educators in Chicago Public Schools. Phenomenal project. We managed to build a wonderful team of a very diverse team of faculty and you know, students uh, working with uh, 125 STEM educators in Chicago over four and a half years. Uh, something I'm really proud of. And in some ways, I think sort of pushed me out of MSU because it's like, I can't top this. I need to go somewhere else and where they don't know me anymore and I can fool them more, right? Um, so that's, you know, end up at ASU. But the idea of this technological, pedagogical content knowledge is that these three things are not separate from each other. And so when we think about professional development of educators, I do a lot of work in the K-12 space. You know, in teacher prep, we will give you methods courses, we will give you, you know, content courses, and we hope that, you know, and actually, to be fair, now we have lots of classes which are about sort of the teaching of content. But then we'll give you this isolated technology course and assume that you can merge those two together, right? Those components together. It doesn't work that way. And so at heart, the PPAC framework basically says that all of us as educators, live at the intersection of those three things. And when I say technology, it doesn't necessarily mean digital technology. We all know faculty members who can't use a whiteboard well, let alone a digital whiteboard, right? And so technology, whether it's print or it's paper, uh, whatever it may be, or digital tools, what have you, we have to think about what our goals are. What do we want students to take away? what the content is that we want covered, how we want to do it. Is it a lecture? Is it a small group? Is it, I mean, what are the pedagogical approaches? And finally, what technological tools are relevant for that? If you want, let's say, students to learn, I mean, if it's a K-12 context, the names of all the 50 states and their capitals, well, guess what? Flashcards are actually a really good way of doing it. And there are some very nice tools out there which track you know, your short-term and long-term memory and how often you need to be reminded and tested to do that really well. That's perfectly fine. If that's your goal, that's okay. But if you want students to become good writers, well, you better give them authentic writing opportunities, something that they can blog and they can do peer review, that they can, you know, maybe it's a wiki. I don't know. That's, that's what's available to you. How would you do it, right? So thinking really hard about 
how these three pieces work together. And one of the challenges I felt during the pandemic is like in this rush to move online, I found a lot of discussion around pedagogy and technology, like how can I use Zoom in an interactive way? How can I do this? I found very little discussion of how content influences, should influence teaching and, you know, and, and, and the use of technology. Because there are differences there. Hi teaching history is different from teaching mathematics. So I think that's really important to understand. And so you know, we jokingly call it the total package. When we first came up with it, we, lacking imagination, we called it the TPCK framework. And then we're like, nobody knows how to say it. You know? uh, so we added an A, we paid 50 bucks, bought a vowel, it was good. So that's sort of the, the at heart, the TPAC framework. It's very, very simple. That's, that's one of the things that I feel is really important to recognize. It's nothing fancy. Good educators have instinctively understood this. But also, it is something that, as an analytic tool to think about your own teaching and ask yourself those questions, it becomes a really powerful thing. Um, it got me tenure, it got me, made me full professor, got me this job here at ASU, so that way it has paid off. Um, <laughs> You know, selfishly speaking, and so my thing is like cite my name and Matt's name correctly, and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, but you know, there are a couple of handbooks. Um, but what's been impressive really is how this framework uh, has really taken off in the field. Um, the one that is most impressive for me, and this is from last year, 2021, 438 dissertations have been written which use this as a founding framework. So these are not ones which are cited. This is not citations. These are publications, articles, chapters, books, and dissertations which have actually used the framework as a theoretical framing for the research. So of course, that, that is very meaningful. Uh, but more than that, it is the impact on practice. Um, I was very proud, Matt and I were very proud to be invited to Australia where they have this project for all 41 colleges of teacher education in the continent of Australia um, was working towards integrating this framework in their teacher education program. But to give one simple example of how this could be, so this is my son, his name is Soham. He was a freshman in high school and he was put in an advanced math class and I remember he had this deer in the headlights look because firstly he's a you know, freshman in high school and he doesn't know which class is where so he's lost half the time. Um, and so we said, okay, let's just talk about math. We won't do math, we'll talk about math. So we used to open his textbook and see what they'd covered last week, what's coming up, and we would just chat, or we would go online, find something. One day, he, we were sitting down, then somebody came by and I had to go talk to them, so I said, hey, go find something online, and I'll come back in a bit. I come back and I find that he's reading this, the Wikipedia page, because that's the first thing that Google threw up, right? And I'm like, why are you reading this? He said, that's what came up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, but the thing is that, then I said, okay, why don't you type in unit circle simulations, right? And suddenly, a whole different way of thinking about the unit circle, Pythagorean theorem, the, the connection between sine and cos, I mean, whole, it's, like a, it's a completely different universe. But it's not his fault that you know, math become a dynamic phenomenon. So to me, that's an example of TPAC. What you want students to understand is not the unit circle. You want to understand the meaning of the unit circle in the context of all of these different ideas and how they dynamically relate to each other. And there are tons of these online, right? And there's no reason why his school should not have been using them. They're freely available, these tools. Here's another, another example. This is the one that I used to do with my STEM educators in Chicago. So, you know, you'd get a problem like this in the textbook, right? Surface area, volume of a truncated pyramid, or whatever, right? And then we have all of these, which is basically meaning that you are so dumb, I'm going to walk you through every step, <laughs> right? And trying to get at the formula is the key. So we would brainstorm and say, okay, how would we make this more authentic? That's one way remove all that other garbage, and let's, in small groups, discuss and figure out. But then, this is what I did. I went out in the street in Chicago. There's a video I shot. That's it. And the question is, what's the volume of that shape? 
And that's all the information you have. And now you put people in groups, and now they're sitting and arguing about oh, how tall must that person have been, how much you know, foreshadowing was there, what's the dimension of like how much is a size 12 shoe compared to a whatever. And you're starting to make back of the envelope calculations. If you get a, a volume or surface area which is like thousands of meters, clearly something went wrong in your calculation, <laughs> right? And think about this. At this point, the formula is the least important thing. You can go look up the formula, right? And so this is where we would have students come up with ways of seeing math in the world around you. Because that's one of the big things that I tell the teachers that I work with, that if you are a music teacher, every sound must connote, some, mean something to you. Right? And Jim is smiling because he's a musician. I don't understand what that means, but, you know, because I have no music bone in my body. But, but if you're an artist, every shape, every color must convey something to you. Positive, negative, neutral, whatever, something. If you're a mathematician, you have to be able to see math everywhere. If you can't do it, you can't get your students to do it. Because you are modeling for them what it means to be a mathematician in this world, an engineer in this world. So I worked with the engineering program at Michigan State uh, to build their um, foundation course. And typically, you know, you'd get these people who had declared engineering as their major. They'd be given this class where different people, faculty would come in and talk about civil engineering one week, something one week, something else one week, okay? And they would have to build a car out of vegetables or something like that. I had given a talk at the freshman class once and this one student came and talked to me and he and I would meet and talk very regularly. So he was doing a double major in music and engineering. And he said something to me very interesting. He said, when I go to the music building, Everybody is living, breathing music. They're talking music, they're practicing music, they're arguing about music. He said, in engineering, when I go there, we meet as a team, we solve the problems of the homework, and then we go. And so we said, okay, how do we, so what's the difference here? The difference is that of identity, of developing an identity as a musician. So my colleague Ben told me, like my, his daughter was like two years old learning to swim. He said, in her mind, she's not a learner. She's a swimmer. She just will drown and die if left by herself. But in her brain, she's a swimmer. While those music students saw themselves as musicians, the engineering students not seeing themselves as engineers. So we started asking, like, what does it mean to be an engineer? A part of what it means to be an engineer is an ability to take the world apart and put it together in some different and new ways. So that's what we did. We would get a fishing reel, we would get a bike, get a doorknob, and we'd give it to a group of students, take it apart, understand how it works, put it back so that it works again. I don't know how a doorknob works. I use it every day. But if I were an engineer, I would care about that, right? I would try to figure that out. So this is a question that I get quite often, you know. And my response is sort of like that. <laughs> because it's the wrong question to ask, I think, honestly. But you know, what if we turn it on its head? And this is a photograph of Ben Gurion. I don't know why I have it there, but it's kind of cute to include in there. Um, and ask the question, is face-to-face -face as good as online? Because imagine if we lived in a world where all of these interactions are happening online, and then we say, oh, you have to come to this box and sit in this box for so many minutes. Right? I mean, one can make that case too, right? Why, why, what's the thing about that? So here's an example of something that I used to do in my intro psych class. The first assignment students used to get used to be this magic trick. And basically what happens in this, you have to remember a card, and then the computer will do all these funky noises and whatever, and then poof, your card is gone. And then we used to ask them, how does this trick work? If I would do this over here, somebody would raise their hand and give the answer, let's say they gave the right answer, everybody else would be like, yeah, yeah, we figured that out. Even though they might not have. But in an online space, what we could do is you cannot see anybody's answer till you have provided an answer. Now, that's an affordance that the online technology allows very easily. That would have been harder to do face to face. So the question is, it depends. You know, it depends on how we design the learning experience, what we are going for, how the technology is being used, 
for what our pedagogical goals are, so on and so forth. So technology in some ways can help us see, but only if we see technology the right way. So this is a, an example, and I, I just beat on Salman Khan for no reason because he's famous, I guess. But I'm not going to show the whole video. And the reason I'm not going to show the whole video is because this is taken from the Charlie Rose. And after the whole Charlie Rose thing came out, I just can't stand to hear his voice anymore. So we're going to skip it. But basically, the video is Charlie Rose asks him about, like, how do you learn when you make these videos? And Salman Khan goes through a bunch of stuff about how he learns. And this is the summary that I can give from it. So he says, like, I immerse myself in the topic. I go on Wikipedia. I go here. I look up books. You know, I scaffold. I annotate. I try to understand why. I try to ask stupid questions. And I make analogies. I call up my friends. He does all of this. And, and the most kicker is however long it takes. And then I create this video, and I put it out there. And people say, oh, you got this wrong. You got that wrong. And I fix it till it's better. Then I do it again. Then why do we recommend watch the video as a way to learn? He has given us a perfect, I mean, if I had to take all of educational psychology and shove it into one slide, this should be pretty much it. So when we think about technology, I think we do a disservice if we think, again, don't get me wrong, video is important. I mean, I got into this field by watching Carl Sagan. So clearly, it transformed my life. But it didn't help me solve differential equations, right? It did certain things, and certain things are better in certain other ways. And that's where I think the technologies become critical. We also have to think about some of the negative aspects of these technologies. My daughter was a student in WP Carey during the pandemic. And she was studying out of her bedroom. And whenever she had an exam, she would come to me. And I was working out of a corner of her guest room, but I had that whole space to myself. She'd have to come in. She'd have to scan the whole room and this and that. What message is that sending? It sends the message that we don't trust you from point one. Right? You are going to cheat. And the funny thing is, when we actually work in our fields, we are cheating all the time in that classical definition of cheating. I'm, if I have a problem, I will call up Jim or somebody who knows more and figure things out. Can we ask questions in ways that allow for that collaboration? That, I mean, that, 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 those are important questions that I think as a field, as educators, we need to be asking ourselves. I am not here to give answers to this, but to say that we have to think of the impact of things like this on the motivation, on sort of the self-respect, on the dignity of the learner. And that's incredibly important. And that underlying every technology, there is a theory of pedagogy. You know? So I hate using, this is just me, I do not like any of the LMSs that are out there, whether it's Canvas or Blackboard or whatever. I just build my own thing using WordPress, and that's the only place students go is for grades is this. And my reason is very simple. I want my students to have a unique experience in my class. Better or worse, I don't know, but unique. They should remember this was Punya's class. And my website, in some way, becomes a representation of me. It's a proxy for me. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to do that, but we need to understand that at standard LMS, whether you're teaching biochemistry or history, looks and feels absolutely the same. It is a series of boxes that you fill up this, then you do this and do that. While we understand that learning and all of that can be much, should be much more organic, flowy, what does that mean? Ask, I, all I say is let's ask ourselves these questions and then be happy with whatever answer we get for now and then ask ourselves the question at the end of the semester again and then tweak something. So I do a lot of work around creativity. So can you read that? So I love doing these kinds of wordplay where with symmetry and, and words. And I think one of the important things here is thinking about how we bring creativity into the teaching and learning that we do rather than see this as being sort of a, a thing. And I think when we bring that to it, I think our students respond the same way, because they see that freshness of eye that we are bringing in. So here are a couple of examples of stuff that I've played with. So you know, we all know what fractals. And so since I love words, and so I said, OK, like, can I make a fractal out of the word fractal? 
goes on forever. These are um, a wonderful paper by one of my, uh, my professors in, in Bombay who looked at the fractal architecture of Indian temples and this idea of self-similarity and how it plays. You'll see this in like mandalas and stuff that way as well. And so that made, prompted this design for self-similarity, which is actually one of my favorite designs. This was the 18-year-old who was writing limericks in that quantum mechanics class. I was, not, I was paying attention to the quantum mechanics because the limericks better be right to the science, right? This kind of play was discouraged, pushed me out of the field that you guys are all teaching me. I'm sure there are other 18-year-olds out there, many of whom don't even know what their capabilities are. And that's a huge responsibility on each of us, especially, I think, because we are at this university called Arizona State University, where our charter demands that we be known by who we let in rather than who we keep out. So we live in a new ecology, standard solutions, hopefully, you know, most probably work. It's not magic. It's a purposeful process of design. It's not about the technology at some level, but yet, since this is the world we live in, it is about the technology. We all sit at that point, whether you like it or not. We reside at that intersection, and hopefully we can leave it better than we find it, which I don't think is going to happen to that ball of yarn once the cat is done with it. So thank you very much. When I started, I said hi. So I said bye. And that's me. Thank you very much for the time. I hope I didn't overstay my welcome uh, in terms of time. But all right. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Punya Mishra. So this is also an opportunity to, to ask some questions. And uh, so we're going to have a couple minutes dedicated to this as well. So, but thank you very much for this very inspirational talk. And uh, it also helped me to get, I guess, impress my new boss at that time by drawing a couple <laughs> circles. So it's not, not just you get, get your tenure and all that stuff. So uh, maybe if you have a question, raise your hand. We have, uh, Jen has this beautiful, what is it called? microphone <laughs> so that can be tossed around and it can be used and we want to use that so that our audience online can is it on question. do I need to do something to turn it on we're good I guess just talk into it yeah okay all right so if you have a question to for there we go oh that's how it works yeah. okay do you have a suggestion for a book to read Uh, yeah, like just you know, pick a topic of your mind related to your talk, and then suggest. Well, so there are the two handbooks of TPAC, right? I mean, my website. I have the. Just drop me an email, or you can just dig it on my website. You should be able to find the title chapter for the second one. That might be useful, but more than that, it's not a, a piece about TPAC to read. It really is what it is you are teaching, what your goals are for your students. That's often hard to figure out. That's, it's not as trivial because you know the, the, there is a syllabus, there is a curriculum. Uh, those are lists. Right? The thing is to try to tap into something deeper about the nature of the field, the domain that you want your students to get good at. There's a, there's a couple of, prof there's I think one professor, a couple of, I don't know, um, who were teaching a, a digital signals processing class. This is in Urbana-Champaign. This is an example I read in a book. And they went back and they interviewed students who had graduated, who had taken their class like five years later and asked them what they remembered. It's amazing how little they remembered. So think about your college class. How many do you remember? And so what he did was he turned that and he said, okay, what are the three things I want my students to take away from this class? And I could get in these details wrong, but essentially they were so simple. They were basically that things are analog in the world. We can slice them using certain mathematical tools. Then we can manipulate them, and we can push them out in the world. Like basically digital this to back, right? Fourier transform, whatever. But core, these three ideas. And then he built his entire curriculum on emphasizing these three ideas. Because he said five years from now, if they don't remember any of the details, but they remember this, that's awesome, right? Same way I worked with a high school biology teacher. So he did this. He took 
what is known as the gold, the, the central dogma of biology, which was by Francis Crick, which is DNA uh, codes protein, uh, DNA codes RNA, RNA codes proteins, proteins code us, or something, make us. DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, proteins make us. So he created posters of this and put them all over his classroom. And everything that they would talk about in the biology unit would always come back, how does this fit this narrative? So when students leave, they might forget AGTC, they might forget which base pairs match with each other, they might forget, but they will remember this. The fundamental thing is the DNA, which codes the information for RNA, which makes protein, which makes this. Because then they can go back, they have a scaffold where the other thing. So that's what I would ask is really, and this is not a solo enterprise, this could be with your group of colleagues, that's actually better. Ask your students, like what should get away? And then the methods will emerge from that. Does that make sense? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but send me an email or look at my website. At least there are some readings there. There's a lot of sort of videos on TPAC that are out there. Um, so there's a lot of information about the framework out there. But I think it's more about thinking about what you want students to take away. That's actually often very hard. I mean, I find it really hard sometimes, even classes that I've taught before, to say, what is this class really about? And it's rarely really about what's in the syllabus. There's something deeper or bigger there. And once you have that, your syllabus might be the same, but the way you talk about those pieces will change because you have a bigger story to tell. And then whatever book you read has to somehow relate to those three things. <laughs> yeah. Question. Sorry, I had a question. Oh, okay. um, for, so you uh, showed Salman Khan's process for learning and uh, the, like we're professional learners, Salman Khan's a professional learner. The students that we're getting are not, they're used to the check boxes, right? How do we build experiences that help teach them how to learn or do you have ideas or? So two things here, right? So one is let's give students the grace that they are learners too, right? that they have been enculturated. I mean, this is my kids after like three weeks of school at dinner table, you ask a question, the hands go up. It's like, <laughs> you're at dinner. It took three <laughs> weeks for them to learn that script, right? And so yes, we have encultured them in very inappropriate ways about learning. But at the end of the day, as a species, we love to play, we love to engage, we love to learn. I think we can tap into that, hmm. right? Is it gonna work for everybody? Not necessarily, I mean, there are lots of, cultural and all kinds of things. So that's, we need to become better at all of that as well, right? I get that. But I think the assumption we have to start with is that if, th this is I think my biggest failure learning for me, because I can see somebody see me in that engineering class and say, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> Nothing's gonna happen with this guy, right? And maybe, I, and I, I'm not maybe, I internalized that. Took me a long time. Right? And so I think that the first step really is, so it's, it's, you know, like for instance, whenever I hear these like UX designers joke about like people are so stupid, they use the CD-ROM drive for their coffee, it drives me nuts. I get really angry. Like don't demean that person. They don't know, they don't know what a CD-ROM is, right? And so there is no such thing as user error, it's a design problem. So if our students are not responding the right way because we haven't figured out a way, mm -hmm. that's on us. Will we succeed every time? Absolutely not. But unless we start with the assumption that it's a design problem, we will just give up. And we see that a lot of that happen all the time. Yeah, totally. Good Let's question see. there. Mm -hmm. I'll throw it. Oh, boom, all right. So I really liked your talk. I, I think it, more people should embrace what you're saying. Um, having been in industry for a long time, it's, it's amazing how many kids come out of school not remembering anything if they learned it in the first place. But one thing I see that is missing that's really important is why. My, two of my kids have gone through electrical engineering at ASU, one chemical engineering, and they tell me about all these great things they've learned, and I ask them, why did you learn that? And their answer is, I don't know. And I think that's why a lot of the student motivation is missing. 
is because we're teaching them all these skills, saying you need to learn how to do Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms and Z transforms, and they have no idea why they're learning this. And I, I think that's a big thing that's missing, and we need to get more of that in our classrooms. I completely agree. I think that education, for the most part, has become this idea of postponement of gratification, right? Which is do X, Y, it'll be useful later. And, I, and that go, starts from like K-12, right? I mean, it, it's not necessarily here. The only sort of nuance I would add to that would be that there are many different Ys. Yeah. Right? And so for me growing up, the why was actually aesthetic. I used to get a kick out of learning something. For somebody else, it might be what use is it to me in getting a job. That's as valid a reason. Sometimes in higher ed, we value one, we value the other. I think that as long as we embrace the fact that there can be many whys, starting from that, so which is why I'm a huge proponent of like authentic problem solving. Like get teams of people together, give them a genuine problem to solve. And then the reason for why we need, I mean, there is a reason why we came up with all these mathematical terms and, and ideas. It helps us understand and explain things in the world around us. What we are doing is we are denying students that, that phase. They don't have to live the entire history of civilization, of course. To just give them information as de facto embrace this without their understanding that question, I think, Absolutely, I wouldn't, wouldn't deny that at all. I think the only caveat I would say is that there are many whys, and we need to sort of work at figuring what would best work there, right? Excellent, and I think the last questions we have from our online audience, so. Oh, okay, you can also use this microphone uh, if you want. All right. All right. Okay. All right, we're gonna be great. I hope yeah. that when yeah, thank you, Jen. <laughs> okay, this is from our online audience. Uh, what are some small changes that, can, that faculty can make with the TPAC framework in mind to ensure that our engineer, engineering students are ready for industry? Well, I think those, I would address it as two different questions. So the second one, I think, came up there, which is this idea of purpose and why are we doing this? How does this help us understand the world and, and, and change the world and, and treat the world, right? What was the first part of the question? Can you repeat that again? I had a slightly different uh, what are small change? Okay. <laughs> what are small changes that faculty can make with the TPAC framework in mind? So one of the things that I always do is when I teach, I make like, I change one thing. So back in the day when blogging had just started, I was like, okay, what does blogging mean for what I teach? So I would take two modules and I would have my students try blogging. And if you think about it, technology, pedagogy, and content sort of tugging at each other, if you make a change in any one of them, the other two have to adjust to work well together. And so one of the things I always say is continue to experiment. Try something new, but don't do it for the entire semester. For Don't put all your eggs in one basket because that is, gonna, is a recipe for disaster. But if you keep trying something new every time that you're doing it, you will find, look back three years from now, five years from now, you'll say, oh my God, my pedagogy has completely changed. I am a changed person or as, or as a teacher. As a, and so that would be my recommendation is every semester try something new. Try a different textbook maybe. Try, look online and find some interesting assignments or projects for students to do. Try some new technology. But don't <laughs> stake everything on. I remember this community college teacher, she got so inspired by like she was in her master's program, and she's like, oh, I'm gonna have all my students like, you know, create these blogs, and I'm like, okay, don't do it, but, and semester later, I just said, how big a disaster was it? I'm like, oh my God, it was such a disaster. Like, because she put everything into one thing, where she was not necessarily comfortable with that technology at that point in time. She couldn't give the guidelines to the students. She hadn't figured out the nuances of it. And so I think the, I do that even today. I always change something. Sometimes it's for the heck of it. You know, it's, it's like stir the pot and let's see what happens. But just don't do it whole scale crazy because that can be traumatic for you and not necessarily beneficial for the students either. So keep changing, keep trying something. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Punya Mishra. One Thank more you, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.